very happy that our co-chairperson of the party, the left, Janine Wissler, is here with us, and she has the floor right away to open this event. Yes, thank you very much, Manuela, and thank you very much for this invitation. I have to say that I'm very pleased to be able to open this conference on this very important subject. It is indeed a very important subject because mobility is a very important issue if we want to meet the climate um, goals, and especially in the automotive industry and the um, transition in mobility in general um, is targeted uh, by many of the demonstrators, for example, the climate activists. So we need a, a quick exit policy from the CO2 uh, production. Uh, and we have understood very clearly this year that uh, the climate disaster is not too far off, I'm afraid. We can feel the effects of the climate change already, uh, certainly in the global south, but also in Europe. Uh, we've seen uh, forests burning, uh, we have seen um, inundations, um, and uh, this jeopardizes the very existence of uh, the people living in those areas. And therefore, uh, we understand that um, protecting the climate is really one of our prime uh, tasks in uh, the in when we talk about um, a transport uh, conversion or a, a transition, then we have to understand that many people working in that industry are afraid of losing their jobs, in, uh, are afraid of losing their subsistence, their livelihoods. And so therefore, we must um, come up with a mm, valid uh, project for actually um, making it work, uh, being very uh, good in uh, defending um, the climate and at the same time shifting um, towards an ecological mobility industry. We need to become much more sustainable at the same time. We need to be uh, democratic in all our endeavors. The automotive industry is certainly one of the most central sectors in this respect, certainly in Germany, because despite the corona crisis and the fact that far less cars were sold, they have made a huge profit. Five billion of those profits were paid out to shareholders in dividends. So um, this is a flourishing business because also the state jumped in and offered um, compensation for furloughing of workers, for example. So some um, big multinationals received um, public funding for the crisis um, in the economy, but then they were at the same time able to pay out dividends, which should be a no-go. Um, we really have a huge problem in that respect. The transport sector, the car industry, uh, still driving around in cars is um, a major danger to the climate and none of the CO2 emissions have been reduced since the 90s. And a huge part of uh, that is um, to... Uh, is caused by mm, the cart uh, or by the by this uh, transport on roads up to 2030 the co2 emissions are supposed to be reduced by over 55 percent in the european union and the uh, climate neutrality uh, should be achieved but um, it is uh, factually probably impossible und äh, daneben soll der Verkehr auch in den Emissionshandel einbezogen werden. Aber die ganzen Themen von Verkehrsvermeidung, Verkehrsverlagerung oder die Verkehrswende, die bleiben aber vollkommen unterbelichtet in Brüssel. Die verkehrspolitische Vision beschränkt 
the traction and the transmission technology. And we really so need what we need in... is uh, public transport much more than the private um, transport on the roads. The electric cars or vehicles um, can not possibly really make up for the ecological uh, game changer that we me need uh, because um, in fact uh, cars and roads use up much too much space and therefore we need uh, public um, transport uh, which must be affordable which must extend its network much broader to all the outlying regions and it must uh, be run in a cost-efficient cost way, of course. This has already been achieved in some cities or metropolitan areas. What we would like to see are countries where, in the main, you will be using trains um, and transport on rails. Uh, uh, but thousands of uh, rail kilometers have been decommissioned in Germany. Hundreds of train stations have been uh, abandoned and uh, huge regions um, cannot be reached by public transport any longer. So that is something we really urgently need to, to change because it also has a social dimension and that's something that Brussels must understand because otherwise we will run into further conflicts of uh, res about resources and we simply need to take stock of um, the social uh, repercussions of our political choices. The European left said at the end of the European Forum last week, we really need uh, an unparalleled shift to new modes of transport for the future. And the opportunities are not bad at all. Um, f from the research, we know that um, stringent, uh, socially minded uh, tr transition of uh, transport could really make up for the potential losses in the car building industry. But we do need a very ambitious um, climate and uh, automotive um, policy to move forward in this area. Uh, we should not leave it to the market forces, um, this whole uh, transition, because uh, entire industrial areas might be destroyed that way. We need a transition fund in order to convert uh, the um, supply chain, for example, in a sensible way. And we need to create alternative employment in the rail transport. Moving to an ecological mobility uh, uh, industry will not be achieved at the same pace in all the individual countries of the European Union. And therefore, I think that the study which is being launched today is a treasure. And we will find um, very interesting initiatives in the study and um, be able to take up some of the ideas, I'm sure. I'm very curious to find out more about the results and um, uh, your findings, and I wish us all a very lively debate. Thanks very much. Ja, vielen Dank, Janine, für deine uh, freundlichen Worte und das Lob der Studie. Um, ja, und vielen Dank, thanks a lot, Janine, for your friendly words and for welcoming the study. And uh, thanks a lot as well to mentioning what uh, we have to do, for example, in Germany to create new jobs in other industrial sectors, but also to mention what we have to do in Europe and what is our task as a European left. So now we are going to present uh, the study. Our different authors uh, are going to talk about it. And we start with uh, Salvador Claros Ferret from the Spanish Trade Union Comisiones Obreras. Please. 
Uh, y gracias a todos por asistir a este evento que me parece que tiene una relevancia especial que todos sabemos, ¿no? Uh, thank you very a... much and thank you for inviting me in for, um, to a such relevant meeting. I only have seven minutes to summarize the main issues. It's quite a challenge in seven minutes. Firstly, we identified that in Spain uh, we were quite late uh, uh, faced with the transformation uh, with the European policies of uh, emission reductions and this lead to question marks regarding the drop in the demand we've seen in the last years uh, uh, deepened by the COVID crisis and also due to the lack of supply of components. Faced with this uh, situation of the 17 plants, uh, manufacturing plants, we see that the majority have um, estimated a drop in the production of 20 to 30 uh, percent. Um, many workers, uh, temporary workers uh, were laid off, uh, not the permanent staff, and that was done through furlough schemes. Uh, uh, due to the lack of uh, microchips, uh, uh, that we think that the follow scheme is going to continue until um, next year, mid next year or the end of uh, next year. So the situation of the manufacturing plants in Spain is quite pessimistic. Now, uh, regarding the manufacturing of uh, electrical vehicles, uh, it's quite testimonial. So we see more hybrid uh, vehicles than electric vehicles, even though the increase in the last years has been spectacular, not exponential, but spectacular. Uh, the lack of the new mobility culture, uh, the difficulties to charge the vehicles uh, are uh, some of the obstacles uh, regarding the industry. Uh, we are faced with the uh, possibility to lose some of the um, assets. Uh, uh, Nissan Motors is going to leave uh, Spain. Uh, it's the first uh, plant closing in Barcelona and it's uh, um, generating quite uh, an alarm in the uh, sector. And uh, the closure of plants might uh, uh, affect uh, the secondary industry. Um, we see that uh, uh, they represent brands uh, that have uh, um, decision making in other countries and this is very important for our industry in order to keep models, resources, etc. We don't have uh, our own production in the country regarding strategic components, so batteries, for example, and microchips regarding batteries. And now um, uh, the, uh, the plants uh, um, uh, are being decided, and there's uh, uh, quite a uh, um, fight uh, between the regions, and he apologizes to the interpreters for speeding up, but if I don't do it, I won't be able to say what I want. So uh, semiconductors also, uh, for 2022, as I said, we foresee um, uh, the furlough schemes uh, going on. And also there are the, um, uh, the sales, the maintenance of vehicles are at risk. Uh, and there is also a very affected sectors due to these main changes. The circular economy finally is a, a part of the business that is very little developed and it might represent a radical change. Now, regarding employment, there's a European study of uh, CLEPA, the European Association of Automotive, uh, uh, talking about a loss of employment of 300,000 uh, jobs. Uh, the electrical vehicle will be um, a loss in the value chain uh, with consequences in the secondary industry and the manufacturers. Uh, uh, the loss of jobs is due to the simplification of components and the 
the less time you need uh, uh, to assemble their vehicles. So, so uh, the loss of companies and of jobs in the uh, sector of components is um, very worrying. Also, we are thinking about uh, the upskilling or reskilling of workers, uh, and now regarding uh, the business model, due to the high price of the vehicles, uh, um, um, marginalise uh, the working class. It's over thirty thousand euros, uh, and uh, it reduces the number of vehicles that can be sold. Uh, we don't see a change in the strategy. Um, for example, uh, rental cars uh, um, instead of buy-in, uh, so services more than uh, ownership of uh, private vehicles. Now, regarding governmental policies, uh, there are important investments. Uh, the government uh, has adopted um, uh, recovery uh, green plan, uh, um, for example, for hydrogen batteries, uh, as well as uh, um, charging uh, points, etc. Now, regarding the uh, sustainable development uh, sector, investments are being made, but in our opinion, that's where uh, we see the weaknesses uh, regarding the changes. And I'm concluding uh, with uh, some general observations. Uh, firstly, the sector is moving between uh, tension with employment and um, environmental sustainability. We don't want to lose employment. It's an important sector. It generates important resources. Uh, but the environmental sustainability is the other uh, side of the coin, and it generates tension. Uh, industry is moving um, in between technology technological change with mobility, uh, the connected vehicle, but that's that change occurs in a first um, stage, uh, the um, technological transformation of the vehicle, but we're not tackling uh, the cultural change, uh, the business model change going from manufacturing to mobility service, uh, which is what we see at the horizon. But we can't see uh, right now this second phase of changes. We don't see it in the agenda of uh, the automotive uh, um, manufacturers. This um, um, poses a, a big question mark, so we don't know whether the sector is going to change, whether there are going to be alliances between the brands, whether there will be changes in production. So this is a very quick summary, but as I don't have more time, thank you very much for listening to me. Ja, vielen Dank, äh, Salva, für die äh, kurze und ähm, sehr pointierte Beschreibung der Thank Situation. Thank you very much, uh, Salva, for this description and uh, naming all the challenges uh, which uh, are coming uh, towards us. Uh, and uh, I have also put the link into the chat for our study. So who's interested can have a look into this uh, study. It's in English. And I'm thankful that you also have been talking about the price. It's very costly to buy an electrical car. And the idea is not really that uh, the change in mobility can be uh, guaranteed by everybody buying now an electrical uh, vehicle. I mean, that's not the idea, because that won't solve the problem of the climate change, because uh, we are in, against another challenge. Now I'm going to give the word to Samuel Klebane. He's a professor at the Sorbonne University in France. So please. Merci, uh, merci beaucoup. Yeah, Annie. thank you. Schön. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. And uh, thank, thank, thank you, Manuela. Thanks to the Rosa Luxemburg for, uh, Foundation. To, how can this uh, uh, sector become a ecological sector? It's a matrix. We have to ponder upon the economic and political uh, reasons for uh, transformation 
i.e. for transforming mobility, but also this raises a lot of questions about the industry, about the sector. In my report, I've tried to answer those questions. I've reached a number of conclusions in terms of uh, how to democrati democratically organize the sector. The uh, uh, car industry in France has a very big weight. It employs uh, 200,000 people, direct jobs, and 2.2 indirect uh, workers uh, in the repair sector, in the repair and maintenance sector. Despite the fact that uh, there is general precarity in employment in France, the car sector, the car industry, still has a fairly high level of protection and remuneration for workers. The, the car industry in France uh, is also a sector where there's a lot, a lot of innovation, thanks to uh, Renault and Stellantis and a lot of uh, uh, suppliers like Folio and Forestia who are number one leader uh, companies. Uh, if you compare this sector with the rail sector, the rail sector is also a historically important sector in France. It has 10 times uh, fewer uh, workers for building um, uh, trains than, than there are in there are jobs in the car sector. It's hard to make comparisons because it's a different logic in terms of production. Car production is based upon a mass system responding to demand, whereas the rail industry needs uh, public orders, uh, durable and long-standing public orders to be able to sustain employment. So what needs to be converted? That's the question, really. We need to also wonder what is the the role and weight of mobility in France today. France is the biggest, the largest country in Europe. It is a, 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 a rural country, uh, and uh, but a, a rural country with a number of uh, big urban uh, areas or conurbations. So we have to look at mobility in France. Since 2000, most uh, large cities have uh, massified their transport uh, uh, offer i.e. trams, uh, underground uh, trains, metro and buses. But, uh, by the same token, a lot of uh, regional trains have been cancelled, which means that access to mobility is a different thing if you live in a city. It's quite different if you live in the suburbs, in the peripheries of uh, uh, cities, where access to services is much more complicated and, and mobility is a crucial stake in France, a political issue uh, Testament to that, to that is the big campaign uh, initiated uh, as from 2018 by the Yellow Vests and also the, the political slogans that you or political decisions that you have, uh, i.e. curbing the maximum speed uh, on, uh, on our roads or uh, uh, making it much more difficult for cars to get access to cities. All these measures are seen as punitive measures by users, whereas many users are actually depending upon their individual cars. Uh, so mobility needs to be accessible to uh, uh, as many people as possible. And in this respect, um, e-vehicles are a, an efficient means to improve uh, the uh, environmental uh, footprint of cars without uh, uh, changing mobility and putting it upside down. But uh, there is uh, a with, with the, the electrical vehicles. We have a vehicle which could be seen as ecological. Uh, the battery duration or life cycle is long. The, the car can be uh, plugged in and connected to the uh, grid, so as to cut uh, 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 fossil fuel related emissions. This means that a technical network needs to be set up, also a framework of rules, political and social rules, to integrate. E electrical vehicles in their environment so that it becomes carbon free. There is also uh, quite uh, clearly an, uh, an economic uh, opportunity. Uh, French producers are uh, making uh, strenuous efforts to uh, integrate uh, the value chain in France and, and in Europe so as to produce batteries, cells to assemble cars and to uh, uh, also have also production of uh, electronic uh, components. Uh. So this is an, a, a possible development, but uh, uh, this means that we need to massify uh, public transport offer. We need to densify rail networks in France because they've been hit hard. 
and we also need to promote uh, soft mobility inside cities. It is a trend which we can identify at the moment. The objective being to develop intermodality, which could be a solution, but this would m this means that, uh, of course, you would need trains that are adapted to the new mode of transport. This raises the issue of uh, prices. Uh, uh, it has to be attractive for families and, and affordable. And we also need to uh, uh, make sure that uh, urban sprawling is limited. We need to uh, make sure that uh, medium-sized cities are becoming more attractive so as to have uh, better transportation uh, flows. Uh, optimistic surveys show that it is possible to create more jobs with this new mobility, more jobs than the jobs that we have with the current mobility. But of course, what types of jobs uh, are, are we going to create and how are we going to orient industry to put it on this, on this path? In my report, I conclude that it is urgent to conduct a democratic industrial policy. What does that mean? It means that industrial policy needs to be uh, included uh, not so much at the service of economic objectives, but it should be put at the service of social and environmental objectives. Social and environmental objectives must be seen as uh, destinations, objectives that we need to uh, achieve, and industrial policy needs to be seen as a means to achieve that end. Today, when we look at uh, the French uh, political situation, these policies are actually conducted at different levels. The environmental, uh, the environmental protection department, there's the economics department, the transport uh, department, they all work in silos, right? What we need to do is we need to develop a holistic policy with a clear, crystal clear objective and with the appropriate resources that can be uh, applied. Uh, if you look at uh, job conversion, well, the employment department needs to uh, put together a training plan in keeping with the social and environmental objectives that we have. Today, wha what can we see? We see that um, na national governments set the objectives, i.e. Uh, the end for uh, uh, internal combustion engines, and uh, uh, big car manufacturers and uh, clients are left free to organize themselves. Um, and this is quite uh, uh, terrific and tremendous in terms of social damage if you look at, for example, public foundries. The government has said uh, by 2030, 2035, we don't want to have uh, internal combustion, combustion uh, vehicles. Try to think of something else. And, and uh, of course, then foundries and other operators have to start planning uh, for the for the medium term, five to ten years. If there were uh, long term planning, uh, things could be anticipated by the different economic operators, by suppliers, and so on. And trade unions could also start working on training plans, which means that conversion would be applied not just to industrial production, but also to employment, jobs. The same can be said about the, ref the repair and maintenance industry. We need to uh, heed these uh, changes to take them aboard, but for that we need a global industrial policy in keeping with the set objectives. In France, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, levels of power with uh, industrialists, elected representatives, uh, representatives of workers, trade unions, and uh, in order to try and, and discuss and uh, plan for the future. But these uh, uh, groups or think tanks should become more uh, active uh, and have a, uh, should, have a, should have a say. Really, the question is, what do we need and how are we going to produce it? This is the general political conclusion uh, that you will see in my report following the uh, many interviews I've uh, conducted with different players in the industry. They share the view that we need to be clear on the objective to discuss, to talk and to plan, to plan. I had to be brief, but of course I'd be glad to uh, to come back to uh, some of the points I've made and to answer your questions uh, uh, at the end of the round of presentations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Samuel. Ah, das Zusammenspiel auch von urbanem Raum und äh, ländlichen Regionen. 
dargelegt hast, wie wichtig es ist, da Samuel, that you have also been talking about the connection we have to draw between the rural areas and the urban areas. And it's uh, really important to take into account the global uh, picture if you really want to draw up a new industrial policy. And now we are happy to listen to Matteo Gadi from the Italian trade union CGEL. And he has also been one of the co-authors of the study. You have. Okay. Many thanks, Manuela, for this invitation. I will share my screen. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I will try in seven minutes to explain the case of Italy. Uh, where uh, the main problem, in my opinion, uh, is not so much the ecological transformation of the automotive sector, but rather the existence or not of an industrial structure of the mobility sector and the corresponding jobs. Because uh, let's see, let's see why. Because uh, first of all, I, I would highlight uh, the Italian situation about the production of vehicle, which is uh, dramatically dropped. Uh, you can see that uh, at the end of the 80s, uh, Italy produced uh, uh, about 2 million vehicles, but 30 years later, vehicle production collapsed, uh, losing around 72%, 72% of the volumes. And uh, the colla this uh, collapse uh, heavily affected the employment uh, of the sector, both from the point of view of the employment level and from the point of view of the employment structure. From the point of view of the employment level, we can see that in 20 years, uh, Italy lost uh, uh, about uh, more than, not about more than 36,000 jobs. But this, uh, this reduction um, differently affected uh, the automotive sector as a whole, because we can see that uh, in the 1998, uh, the most part of employment uh, was in the final assembly of motor vehicles with uh, 52%, but 20 years later, on the contrary, the most part of the employment in the sector is on production of parts and components. Um, some authors uh, uh, in front of this data, some authors stated that, okay, Italy can lose the production of vehicle, but at the same time can specialize in the component production. This is not true. First of all, because uh, an Italian national champion in component production doesn't exist. Because of three or four years ago, FCA sold the Magneti Marelli to a Japanese company, Calzone can say, and Magneti Marelli was the largest component producer in Italy. So we, doesn't, we don't have a national champion producing parts and components for automotive sector. And between the top 10 uh, component producer in Italy, only three are Italian. And, all the other are foreign owned uh, from Germany, uh, from Japan, from France, uh, from USA, etc. And the, the rest of Italian company are small, medium enterprises. So they are very weak from the point of view of the budget, from the point of view of the financial capacity, of the investment, of the industrial capacity, etc. Second, the most part, 52% of uh, component produced uh, are exported abroad, uh, in particular within the European Union, and in particular the first destination country is Germany. But it's clear, uh, if uh, the uh, final assembly plants uh, are located in Germany, the German plant uh, will absorb the production of parts and components produced in Italy. So, uh, basically in the absence of a domestic manufacturer producing uh, vehicles uh, and in this way 
cap capable of absorbing the production of parts and components for a multinational, there is no reason to remain in Italy to produce parts and components. And in this way, the production of parts and components can be relocated abroad, in particular in the, in the so-called low-cost countries and in particular close to the German plants. So, even the production of parts and components in Italy is at risk of relocation abroad. And to summarize, uh, uh, the production of vehicle dramatically dropped. Uh, the production of parts and components can be relocated abroad. So the question is, can public transport sector compensate for the decline of the automotive industry? My answer is very worrying because this depends on public policies. I mean, the investment decided by national government or by uh, public authorities depends on the existence or not of an adequate industrial production capacity. I mean, an industrial structure capable to produce buses and trains. And finally, for the rules of the European public procurement framework. First of all, public policies. The first table concerning the, the buses. And we can see that both from the point of view of the employees and the buses, the number in this period uh, dropped. Uh, in a similar situation, we can see in the second table of this slide, about the trains, both from the point of view of the traction vehicle and from the point of view of the passenger coaches. Because uh, the budget cuts defined by Italian government uh, according to the austerian and neoliberal policies determined this situation. So the number of buses, the number of trains, the number of employees of this sector in this period dramatically dropped. Second, about production capacity. Uh, this table is dramatic. We can see in the first column, the number of buses manufactured in Italy. And in the second column, the buses registered in Italy. The buses registered in Italy per year range from 2,000 and, uh, and 4,000. But the number of buses produced in Italy is very, very low. And this difference means import from abroad. The situation is similar about the production of train. Yes, of course, a train industry in Italy exists, but it is dominated by the multinational like as Alstom and Bombardier, uh, which have an industrial structure fragmented and widespread across the Europe, in particular within the European Union, in the low cost country like as Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, etc. And they can relocate abroad part of the total of, of the train production. And finally, because my time is finished, the European rules about public procurement. Uh, European neoliberal policies cannot allow the government when a government issue a public tender to buy trains and buses to insert with it public tender, the so-called social clauses. I mean, clauses with guarantee that the production of this public means of transport take place on national territory. So we are losing the automotive industry. We are losing the parts and component production. We are at the same time very worrying about the situation of the mobility sector as a whole, because the data demonstrated that the production of buses, the production of, of, of train cannot place in Italy, but on the contrary, could be relocated abroad. So I think many thanks for your attention. And I think that you understood that I'm very worried for Italian situation and in particular for the, for the situation of Italian workers. Many thanks. Ja, vielen Dank, Matteo. Ähm, vielen Dank, äh, dass du auch darauf eingegangen bist, dass wir eigentlich den europäischen... Thank you Ost very much, uh, Matteo.
I'm very glad you mentioned um, the European framework uh, for public uh, procur procurement and that we need the social clauses in this uh, procurement uh, rules and that you have explained it very well in your study. And uh, now I'm talking uh, to everyone. Uh, we can have a little debate now if there are any questions, if uh, you have any comment uh, to our speakers. Just raise your hand in the chat uh, or you just uh, click on your camera. We are going to continue now with uh, Monika Martis Kova because she has been uh, working with her colleague on the study for the Czech Republic and uh, Slovakia. And she's working in the Celsi Institute and she's an expert in this field. So you have the floor, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today. Um, yeah, I'm supposed to briefly uh, actually present two, ca two case studies or two studies we uh, produced with uh, my colleagues Patrick Gajo and Tom Smith. Uh, so on Czechia and Slovakia. So I'll try to compare a bit the two countries, although they are very, very similar in many aspects. Uh, so when we talked about uh, the reduction of workplaces in Italy and France, most of them appeared in these countries. Yes. So, so, so the, the employment uh, in the last 20 years uh, rocketed in, in the in automotive industry, mostly through foreign direct, direct investments. Yeah. Um, uh, automotive industry as such employs around 5% of the whole workforce in these countries. Um, and uh, uh, Czechia has like three final producers, Slovakia already four final producers and uh, quite a lot of uh, suppliers uh, engaged with super high share of uh, foreign direct uh, or of, of uh, multinational companies involved. So there is like local element uh, is missing and uh, it's one of uh, my uh, discussion points for the further discussion is that uh, what about uh, countries where uh, the foreign direct investments played such an important role and the car industry was like mostly imported into the country as such. Uh, and the local policies were mostly reduced to attracting foreign direct investments. So, engage, so politicians mostly engaged in competitive bidding, but not that much developed some local policies to, um, uh, to, to, to bring something own in, into this industry. Yeah? Uh, so, so in such a situation, uh, these car industries, uh, industries appear uh, to be in uh, uh, in like so dependent position that it's so difficult for the local actors to even find a way how to uh, how to deal with the situation. Yeah, this was uh, very uh, visible from the interviews we did. We did interviews with uh, trade unionists, employers, NGOs. Um, also uh, 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 journalists to see about the discourse uh, on, on the transformation of this industry. And, uh, and, and we find out that, that for, for many uh, of, the, of the local stakeholders, it's even difficult to understand where it is going. And uh, the, the, here, this dependent position appears that, that it's, it's quite difficult for them uh, uh, to, to, to develop their own strategy and at the same time to understand where it is going. When we looked at more like, bro and actually this study was perfect opportunity for us as a researchers to also look at this like mobility industry as such to see the whole ecosystem in the local country. But uh, first of all, you uh, with such a dependent country on foreign direct investment and uh, so, so you will have the production completely um, uh, uh, completely out of the consumption, yes. So, so the cons consumption of uh, of the cars or of the mobility is something completely different story than uh, than the production. So, you may have production of electric cars in Slovakia and Czechia, but the, these sales are super low. Uh, so, so there is like a disconnection. Also, in our study, we looked at other. Uh, at the production of other mobility uh, transportation uh, systems or, or, or vehicles. And uh, this also gives another uh, picture how these countries may be prepared for the transformation or where the transformation will be heading. Uh, while in Czechia, there is 
other transport vehicles production. There are 24,000 people employed. Uh, for uh, three bus uh, finalists produces buses here. In Slovakia, there is nothing else than the car production and the individual car production, and around like 5,000 other people work in some production or repairs uh, of trains and, and these like other things. So I I. I would support Mateo's hesitations about the possibility to do uh, to do the transformation and and the, the relocation of jobs from one mobility uh, industry from car car industry to other mobility industry because there is simply no uh, space to uh, to employ all uh, three hundred or not three hundred but even like one hundred thousand employees to relocate to other mobility industries. So this this not doesn't seem to be uh, an, an option for, for, for these countries. Um, yeah, and, and uh, in terms of uh, relocation or, or building this like new uh, 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 new value chains uh, in terms of like battery production uh, and and uh, uh, extraction of lithium and and uh, these issues, it it also may produce some uh, workplaces and it, it may not be that disaster in terms of like. Uh, the final result of workplaces in these countries, but the, the question is the, the quality of workplaces and the structural unemployment, which current employees will be facing. Because that there is like more than one third of all employees employed in the car industries in these countries are manual workers, which with the digitalization and automatization and with the cars, uh, electric cars production, they will be becoming very soon redundant. And the local policies are, are not ready to deal with the with the uh, employees which are redundant. It's uh, the, the, the this is something these countries solved in their uh, when trans when in the transition period in 90s uh, when when the communism fall. They solved the situation with attracting foreign direct investment. So so the response for the uh, of for the structural unemployment was uh, to attract foreign direct investment, but this may not be again an answer for the future development uh, uh, in the automotive industry globally. Uh, and, and the local impacts will be like very severe, I'm afraid. And this uh, is not really even discussed in these countries. So, so this, this, these are uh, our main uh, concerns uh, and, and main points from, from the studies we produced uh, for Czechia and Slovakia. So I stop here, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Monica, and thank you very much indeed for having appointed us uh, to the fact that it would be very useful to establish um, uh, indeed uh, the value chains locally, but how difficult it is because there's this huge dependence on uh, foreign direct investment. Uh, present and it is very clear from the texts in both the uh, Czech Republic as in Slovakia. Now I'm very very pleased um, that Tanya and uh, Darko are also there. They are the co-authors um, from Serbia and they work at the Center for Politics of Emancipation in Belgrade and have um, submitted a very interesting text on Serbia. Please, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Thank you all for having us in here uh, tonight. Uh, first, because of the short time, uh, first I'll uh, very shortly represent the findings uh, regarding the automotive sector in Serbia and then uh, Darko will talk more about the uh, interviews. Uh, I mean, the the our findings regarding the interviews with stakeholders. Uh, so first of all, uh, if you want to get at least a partial picture about the uh, uh, automotive sector in Serbia and the, uh, uh, its impact on the labor sphere, I think it's uh, um, it's very important to understand actually the position of Serbian state in the global division of labor. And we can say that the whole transitional period from socialism to capitalism until today 
was characterized by the process of deindustrialization, uh, privatization of almost all productive resources uh, in combination with the extremely bad macroeconomic policy, monetary policy, fiscal policy, which actually increased the dependence of Serbian state on the import. So we can say that uh, Serbia remained on the periphery of capital markets, which means um, minimal or better to say no power at all to influence global economic flows. So taking into consideration the lack of capital, Serbian government is completely oriented towards the, uh, attracting the uh, foreign investment, which of course uh, means creating the environment and uh, favorable condition for, for, uh, uh, for capital, which means of course that the owner of the capital invests less funds and get the highest profit. So we can say that almost all FDI that are coming in Serbia are searching for low, uh, low skilled or even unskilled labor. So the production based on new technologies uh, that can actually improve the economy are very, very limited in Serbia. So it's mostly about the production of the components, uh, marginal, marginal components for vehicles. And these are very <laughs> often dirty industries that are endanger the environment even. So, uh, but we can say like uh, that Serbian government continues to, to sell their workers, offer their workers uh, to foreign investors as uh, highly qualified and cheap labor for private companies. It's of course more important that it's cheap than it's highly qualified. So we can say that earnings in these sectors are around uh, uh, minimal guaranteed, uh, legally uh, minimal guaranteed uh, uh, level. Uh, uh, taking into account that in the automotive sector in Serbia are working uh, around 60,000 people, uh, waste majority of them are uh, receiving a salary that is at the minimum level, which is in Serbia now around 270 euros, let's say it like that. So uh, we can say that uh, these uh, uh, legally regulated minimum wage represent the greatest benefits for the for the companies and those low wages enables companies to save almost 80 percent of their of their costs so but comparing to 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 other countries we can say that serbia has a lower uh, corporate uh, profit uh, tax rate so for example um, if company uh, invests more than uh, 8.5 million of euros and employs more than 100 people uh, they are exempt from paying the uh, uh, corporate income tax rate uh, so like uh, for next 10 years from the moment when they start to make a, a profit in serbia and that's almost all, all uh, uh, almost all automotive uh, companies that are operating in serbia uh, it's like that. So also uh, Serbia offers them very cheap electricity, very cheap water. Uh, we can say that in Serbia there are 15 trade zones uh, where these automotive companies that are operating are uh, exempt from paying the uh, tax, uh, uh, value added tax on the cons uh, construction materials, on uh, energy, transport, uh, fuels. Uh, also, in these uh, free zones, uh, they are exempt from paying custom duties on the raw material, on equipment, on, on uh, construction materials, and so on and so on. Also, local governments are uh, very often uh, offering to those private companies the, the uh, land at the price which is much lower than the market price, which very often turns into the free transfer, or free, free transfer of land uh, for private companies. So the list of incentives are not, uh, sorry. The list of incentives are not ending uh, in here. Also Serbian government uh, offers uh, financial subsidies for those companies, but because we are very short at time, I think it's time to that Darko will take the floor. Thank you. Yeah, I just to add to this, uh, uh, that this, position this whole situation puts the the workers mostly in the in very precarious position and they don't have any any kind of uh, negotiating power especially because uh, there is uh, uh, serbian automotive sector only produces components not not whole products only uh, uh peripheral components mostly uh, like cables and and, and maybe, uh, maybe some windshield motors that, that what uh, i think that windshield motors is one of the most complex uh, uh, product from this market 
but uh, from the from the, our talking with the stakeholders, we talk with the uh, uh, representative trade unions of even company management uh, from the uh, uh, scientific community, NGOs dealing with, with uh, environmental protection and so on, uh, journalists also. Uh, we could conclude that uh, yeah, uh, th there are two perspectives on the environmental protection or, or the environmental environmental transition. Uh, people who come from scientific community and, and NGOs mostly they do see the the, the problem uh, with the uh, electronic vehicle production, most of the car production. They they don't see that as a green transition. Uh, they understand that that uh, this transition should be focused mostly on the public transportation. But uh, these groups are not in the position to implement any kind of climate kind of policies. To policies, they are not even in position at this moment, at least. To influence the policies, they are very marginal. Uh, environmental NGOs and, and, and part of that scientific community, uh, people coming from trade unions or working in automotive industry or general public generally uh, considers uh, environmental transition uh, as transition to to using e vehicles, uh, personal e cars, uh, which is problematic. But this is how how generally this is presented in public. In, in government is giving subsidies uh, for the uh, pur purchase uh, of uh, e vehicles. Uh, so, uh, trying to 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 push some other agenda is going to be going to be kind of difficult. Uh, this is this is indicative of this lack of knowledge in, in the general public, but this is also indicative of of uh, fear mostly from the uh, basically people working or associated with the auto industry as such as it is, because they are also like similar like in Italy or or or, or like we could heard in, in Czech or uh, uh, Czech and Slovakia. That they are afraid for their jobs. They 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 don't mind. They, they think that they could produce parts because they're producing parts. They, they can produce parts for whatever industry. But they think that uh, a switching possible to to public uh, transportation vehicles or whatever cannot produce enough of jobs or, or, or enough of a requirement for for, for the parts. Um, and uh, it is interesting maybe to 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 just mention that, that they do uh, see that these the stakeholders can identify the biggest barriers to transition. They, for one, they they can very good identify this position of Serbia in the global economy. They do understand that uh, they don't have any kind of power. That even uh, producers here don't have any power. These are any companies that they that uh, that are being dictated from 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 uh, whatever uh, where, wherever the headquarters of these companies are. There is basically no uh, domestic companies in, in Serbia. Uh, uh, but they also see the uh, the the one of theirs is the the local the the, the government Serbian government that is focused mostly on uh, attracting of the foreign direct investments, like, like, like uh, Tanya mentioned, the, uh, which means that uh, they are lowering standards, both working uh, for, the, for, for the workers, but also for the environment. environment. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, but uh, representatives from NGOs, they also mentioned the, 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 the learn culture, so to say, the, so that, that even, uh, even there, there was a political push Maybe better uh, uh, for for the green transition that they that most of the people would find hard to 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 change their behavior and their dependency on the car, especially when uh, the implementation of the public transportation needed for the for the for the whole site to function would be needed to be so radical because the public transportation at this point is in a very dire dire, dire state. So uh, Serbia is now importing uh, the the. Uh, Euro three or Euro two uh, uh, combusting engine uh, cars from the EU because they are cheap because people do need them uh, cheap vehicles to to, to transport to, to to the to the well to commute to, to their uh, their uh, works uh, jobs uh, because uh, public transportation is very very in a very bad condition and uh, not, it can't be probably fixed in a, in a short term, actually, maybe, maybe in the long term. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, but, but uh, the positive situation, let's say, is that uh, we can see the rise of the environmental uh, consciousness in the wider population. Uh, in Serbia, at this point, there are ongoing mass protests against the uh, lithium mine uh, that uh, Rio Tinto company is uh, trying to establish Rio Tinto in the, in the near future plans to, 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 uh, to uh, start the exploitation of lithium and 
people are rebelling against this because of the, the environmental uh, consequences that this could bring. This uh, indicates the, the, the rise of environmental consciousness, but uh, uh, what the policies uh, are, are still are very unclear. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the time and yeah. Yeah, thank you, Darko and Tanya. Thank you. Thank you, Darko and Tanya. You have given a very clear picture. We have, on the one hand, uh, the dependence uh, of the industry. They really need uh, to produce uh, small components, uh, small parts, and then you really have to ask the questions, do we have an industrial basis uh, for an alternative uh, production? But uh, then on the other hand, uh, if we think of uh, the huge production we had in the railway sector in Serbia and the public transport uh, sector, which was very strong there in the past, uh, and now we are in front of a huge uh, challenge again, uh, I think that's very impressive. Uh, and uh, I can only invite you to read their part in the study. They had conducted 18 uh, interviews uh, to elaborate uh, their part. And now I've got good news. Uh, we have another representative from the, e, the IEMA Institute in uh, Brazil. Isis uh, Dimis, uh, she's working uh, for the industry in uh, for the institute in brazil who has contributed uh, to the part uh, of the study which is uh, talking Thank about the situation in uh, the brazil opportunity to be here it's a pleasure to be able to present to you the conclusions drawn by iema i would like to excuse the members of the team who couldn't be here for health reasons. So I'm going to convey their conclusions. They carried out a study and the entire team was involved in writing this study. During this study, we tried to understand the transformations the Brazilian industry is going through and to try to compare it to the economic situation of the country. We studied the electrification of cars and the role digital technologies play in Brazil. The main risks we identify was a loss of jobs along the entire productive chain to continue to produce internal engine powered vehicles and importing electric powered cars, making the car become a consumption good reserved to elites, the general failure of the public transport and the return of clandestine means of transport. The clandestine public transport affected huge cities in the 90s and this phenomenon is back and there's no political will to promote public transfer policies that would enchain a chain in urban mobility so that we can guarantee the right to transport this is a fundamental right the country is going through an economic slowdown and that is a generalized process and the country is going through a, a slow down in industry, industrial production. Audi, Mercedes closed their plants and our capacity to produce is shrinking and our imports are increasing. This will create more unemployment and jobs will be transferred to other countries. In Brazil, we've got subsidiaries of industries that follow the guidelines from the parent company. And Brazil went through a huge technological transformation when we introduced flex cars that use ethanol and other kinds of uh, fossil fuels. And what we would like to say is that we would like to use more hybrid vehicles that are produced in Brazil and to use electric cars, but these would have to be imported. This is a luxury segment. Part of these jobs could be compensating, creating more jobs in assembly lines that produce body works and chassis. But for that, we ha would have to relocate 
the workers from the automobile chain to other industrial branches. We should substitute the use of diesel by the use of electric powered cars, but we don't have a national strategy to make this a reality. Brazil could broaden this market because the Brazilian has uh, Brazilian industry produces buses. We have a strong tradition in manufacturing buses, and we export them to neighboring countries. And we are competing with lots of chassis manufacturers who are trying to see what they would use, battery, gas, hybrid fuels. And we, when we talk about zero emissions, well, through our studies, we realize that we should promote the electrification of our fleet to have more battery-powered cars. But if we don't get government subsidies to make this change possible, we will fail if we try to change the motors of the buses, because the diesel-powered buses is a very consolidated industry. Brazil is lagging behind. It's going through a deindustrialization process, so we would need to plan and we would need to coordinate policies and align them to technological developments. It would be up to the state to regulate the markets and promote public interests. And they should recover the public transport. Promoting tra public transport would create jobs, would create income, and it would create factories that would build components. And this would improve public mobility. We need to invest in our national bus industry that already exports to other countries and make those who live in cities who don't use public transport, who use private cars, decide to use public transport. And we would have to have a better quality public transport to make this a reality. If the Brazilian industry does not embrace digital transformation and doesn't change its ways, and if there are no public objectives to promote public mobility while reducing socioeconomic differences, what will happen is that we will suffer setbacks. I would like to remind you that in six months, the number of Brazilians who started living below the poverty line was triplicated. We have almost 28 million people living below the poverty line in Brazil. So we really need public policies, and we have to think in the greater good. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much. Ja, vielen Dank, Isis, für den beeindruckenden Vortrag und Dankeschön. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Isis, uh, for your presentation. It was uh, great that you could uh, spontaneously uh, help us out. It uh, looked like as you had prepared it uh, before. And yes, it is really important uh, to think uh, of the public transport also as an instrument uh, to close the gap between the rich and the poor and uh, to give an offer for everybody. And we see that uh, in the big uh, cities, there is a lot of pressure on transport, the individual transport, because there are a lot of illegal vehicles uh, driving around and uh, they don't really guarantee the right uh, to mobility. And it is really necessary to create a bigger offer of uh, public uh, transport. And it is not uh, about importing more luxury cars and vehicles to Brazil. And uh, I think that's also very important for Europe where these luxury vehicles often come from. So now I want to give the opportunity to our participants uh, questions, uh, comments. Uh